So yes, thank you for joining us today. My name is Florence Pardo from the Food Foundation uh, and a pleasure to welcome you all to the third webinar in our emergency food planning series. Uh, this series is part of our Food Cities 2022 Learning Partnership. Um, and if you uh, don't know about the Food Foundation's uh, Food Cities Learning Partnership, um, I'd encourage you to go and explore our learning platform that we've put together on our website. And I'll drop that into the chat in just a minute. Um, <clears throat> this, the first series that we put on was uh, looking at food strategies and how cities can go about uh, establishing a food strategy for their city. Uh, and we're really excited um, uh, for this second webinar series focusing on emergency food planning. Um, I'm going to be handing over to Kim uh, in just a second. Uh, Kim is from the uh, Food, sorry, Feeding Cities Group, and she uh, has been our lead consultant on putting together the emergency food planning series. Um, her and her colleague uh, Kelsey have done a fantastic job so far. We've had two really, really fascinating webinars, and they've been putting together brilliant case studies and resources to accompany each webinar. Um, if you haven't yet explored those previous webinars, again, you can uh, discover those on our learning platform and I'll drop that link into the chat in just a second as well. So you can watch back those previous webinars. And I'd really, really encourage you to, to explore those case studies that um, Kim and Kelsey have put together because uh, there's some really, really valuable learning there. Um, so without further ado, it's my pleasure to hand over to Kim. Oh, and just before I do, just to mention, of course, we're recording the webinar, so please, um, do keep your cameras off if you don't want to be on film, but we'd love to see your faces um, and feel free to use the chat function freely throughout the webinar. We'll be having a, a discussion at the end. The, um, the speakers section of the webinar will last about an hour and then we've got an optional hour for anyone who'd like to stay in to really dig down into these issues uh, and have a, have a conversation. So um, I will now hand over to Kim. Thanks very much. Thanks, Florence. Um, really helpful. Kelsey, if we want to go ahead and and start screen sharing, we just have a few slides and then we'll get into our speakers, um, which we'll be doing in an interview format. Um, one thing you should know, we always have over 60 people registered for these webinars, which is really exciting. Uh, th this webinar series, it's being promoted quite widely. But because of, as, as you all know, lots of webinars out there today, and because we're so global, everyone from Nigeria to the US, et cetera, signing up for these webinars, I think people are just waiting for the recording so they can watch them at a more convenient time, especially as we approach the holidays. So we always get this really dedicated group showing up. So thank you all, we really appreciate it. And you get the luxury of asking all the questions and, and engaging and what, what driving the conversation to wherever you wanna go. So please drop questions in chat. And as Florence said, we also have this optional hour at the end where you can continue to ask us all questions. But thanks tons for the Florence and the Food Foundation and Chalene Malou for all of their support and, and making sure these webinars happen, which are really important. So Kelsey, if you wanna to go to the motivation slide, why are we here, right? As the Food Foundation and the Feeding Cities Group has recognized, very few cities have emergency food plans in place. What they do is when a crisis happens, they scramble, and that's what we're gonna hear about today. Even when they had plans in place, sometimes those plans aren't quite uh, robust enough for the extreme storms and natural disasters uh, that we're getting today. So Kelsey, the next slide. So we, when we develop this webinar series, there are five webinars in the series. We have four built around different shocks so that the different shocks lead to different solutions instead of thinking about it in a very generic sense. So we've gone through the pandemic, refugees, now we're in the natural disaster webinar. And the last one will be when you have a vulnerable food supply and thinking about emergency food in that chronic situation. Kelsey, we'll go on the next slide. The learning platform resources, as um, Florence mentioned, right? It's not just the webinar we're providing. We develop these case studies for every webinar that are really concise tactics to try. And this, the one um, that we created for this webinar, it's around planning for catastrophic events with all of the lessons learned from Puerto Rico. We have two speakers from Puerto Rico, Rico today, and and they'll they'll talk more about that, but the the case study will be a nice complement to that. We hope, 
and then some other great resources for you to read. And again, we encourage you to, to check out for the other, the other webinar topics that we've had so far. Okay, Kelsey, and then I think we'll just do a quick overview of who's speaking today. And I'll introduce each as we get started, but we have the global expert perspective. We're really excited to have Chris Rebstock here from the Global Food Banking Network. And then really two amazing perspectives from Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, Alex Amparo from FEMA and Denise Santos from the Banco de Elementos Puerto Rico. And sorry, my pronunciation of that is probably horrible. So some questions for you to think about as we go through it is, is your city prepared to feed residents in the event of a catastrophic historic disaster? And you know, if your answer is we can never be prepared, I think that's the wrong answer. We would encourage you to say, try to be as prepared as possible and to think through some different components of that plan, which is what you'll hear about today. And again, please uh, enter things in chat. Kelsey and Florence will both manage that chat as we go through the day. Great, so I think we're ready to get started with Chris is our first speaker. Welcome, Chris. Chris is the uh, international, he's at, with the Global Food Banking Network, which is an international nonprofit that works against hunger by uniting and strengthening food banks globally. He's a founding member of Global Food Banking Network, and he's the director of field services. He has over 30 years of experience working with food banks and a lot of that within natural disasters. So welcome, Chris. Thank you. Great. Good to be with you all. So we're really glad you're able to join us and share about your extensive experience working with food bank networks globally. Um, we know you're, as I said in the introduction, we are one of the co-founders of the Global Food Banking Network, which launched operations in 2006, I believe. Yes. So perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about its current size and scope, and has it exceeded your expectations when you founded it, helped found it in 2006? Sure. Well, today, um, GFN uh, is supporting food bank uh, systems in 44 countries, um, and we're in assisting local leaders in developing food banks in another 10 countries. Um, and we're on uh, every continent, um, uh, putting a big focus right now into Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa in terms of development of new food banking systems. Um, Latin America is pretty well saturated. Almost every country in Latin America has food banks. Um, almost, uh, uh, and Europe is also very well saturated. Um, many, many, um, I think 29 countries total um, in Europe uh, have food banks. Um, in 2020, just to give you a sense of scale of the, of the system, in 2020, uh, GFN food banks uh, served 40 million people, um, and they did that primarily through a network of about 60,000 uh, community service organizations uh, in the in the 44 countries where they're located. Our growth over the last four years has been incredible, and especially in this last year, uh, in 2020 and and in 2021, um, as a result of uh, the implications of COVID on. Um, the, the a huge increase in need um, and and driving uh, incredible uh, creativity around access to, to food uh, in order to meet that increasing need. So just to give you a point of comparison, in 2019, our network served about 18 million people. In 2020, it was 40 million people. Um, wow. Just a, in, incredible uh, growth in, in a very, very short period of time. And as far as as far as uh, whether it, we're on track for what we were anticipating when we started in 2006, um, I would say yes, we are. Um, especially with what we've seen evolve over the last uh, two or three years. That's amazing. Well, we're going to hear from Puerto Rico's food bank later this hour uh, and their role in providing critical food aid after Hurricane Maria. But perhaps you could tell us what you've seen in terms of the role that food banks have played after natural disasters in other areas. Sure. So most of my experience in, in, with food banks um, and disaster response were um, during the 20 years that I worked at Feeding America, which is um, the US um, food bank network. 
um, the Food Bank in Puerto Rico is a um, part of, excuse me, I'm really sorry, I forgot to put this on silent. Um, the, the Food Bank in Puerto Rico is a part of the Feeding America uh, system. Um, and, um, and in that context at, at uh, Feeding America, um, it, it became very clear that food banks are a natural partner um, to work with uh, with national governments, with uh, local governments, uh, and with other NGOs in responding um, to disaster. They typically have warehouse facilities capable of storing and manipulating large volumes of, of food um, and response supplies. They've got extensive volunteer networks uh, that they can mobilize uh, to assist in, in, the, in the response effort. They have already established distribution networks um, where they can push food out into the community uh, relatively quickly. Of course, during disasters, um, some, of those, um, some of those agencies that make up that distribution network are, are affected and, and are potentially immobilized um, but they can lean on the on the breadth of that distribution network uh, in order to uh, move product out. They've got vehicles for moving product around and they understand food safety management and logistics and accountability. Um, and 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 probably more most importantly, they already have existing very strong trusted relationships with the food industry which is where a lot of the product in response to a disaster situation is gonna come from. And so they can, they can uh, quickly mobilize um, response campaigns with the uh, various segments of the food industry um, in order to drive more product in a short period of time uh, into the response effort. Right. Yeah, that's really incredible and, and, and a great segue into our our next question, which is about, if you can tell us about that innovative joint effort between Feeding America, as you just talked about the US Food Banking Network and FEMA, our federal disaster management agency, um, and how they coordinate on the public response to sure. natural disasters. Although I'm not um, directly engaged in, in disaster response activity now, um, uh, other than providing some assistance to more and more of our food banks uh, globally that are beginning to get into disaster response activity. When I was at Feeding America, I was responsible for managing our network's disaster response uh, activity. And, and at that time, um, one of the most significant uh, developments that we had was, was the creation of a formal relationship to the American Red Cross and to FEMA. Um, and so the Feeding America network had, uh, de had developed a memorandum of agreement with uh, FEMA uh, and with the American Red Cross. And, and in that um, defined specific roles for food banks to play. Um, um, Feeding America was part of National VOAD. VOAD uh, stands for Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster. It's a coalition of NGOs that are focused on different aspects of, um, of response and, and preparedness activities. Um, and they're organizations that differ from food relief to mental health services, to logistics management, to housing issues, to care of pets and other wildlife and all, all different kinds of NGOs come together and make up the VOAD organization. And, it, and it, in the context of being part of that, that national VOAD, with, which had incredible uh, institutional support from FEMA, FEMA uh, actually appointed a number of um, um, bells um, and and Alex, I'm gonna have to lean on you because I can't remember exactly what the uh, acronym stands for. Um, voluntary agency, voluntary agency liaisons. There you go. Um, <laughs> so so this was a team of folks spread right across the uh, the country who were, who played the liaison role between the um, the NGOs that were part of VOAD and other NGOs as well. Um, and the government's uh, response. Um, and, uh, and, and so in defining a, a formal relationship with FEMA, Feed, Feeding America um, then had access to resources that it might not otherwise have. And I'll give you a very, very brief example. When Hurricane Katrina struck, 
all the gas stations around the affected area were commandeered in order to protect um, the, the fuel resource for response um, uh, vehicle, vehicles that were involved in response activities, all different kinds of response activities. Um, but food banks uh, who, were, who were engaged in the response effort had access to that fuel resource because of our partnership with FEMA. So that's just one simple um, example of how connecting uh, to the official um, government uh, uh, response uh, a, agency responsible for uh, managing the activity um, can benefit the broader um, NGO-based response effort as well. That's great. And Chris, do you know, have other countries adopted something similar and should they? Yeah, um, I, I, I know when I left Feeding America and came over to GFN right around that time, in Japan, they they were pretty far down the line of creating um, a, an equivalent to the VOAD concept, um, and they were seeking to engage uh, formally um, uh, with the Japanese government's uh, response agency, uh, FEMA equivalent, um, and in a number number of other countries like Australia and Mexico, um, uh, in particular Argentina. Uh, food banks have established relationships with their country's disaster response authorities. Um, sometimes those relationships are formal and have uh, formal agreements. Sometimes they're, uh, they're informal, um, but the, the connection uh, is strong and the roles are defined, even if it's in an informal structure. And, and the uh, food bank systems are able to um, engage immediately uh, when, a, when a disaster is declared. Right. GFN is in the process right now of building a number of different resources around training and, and best practice sharing um, to help encourage more and more of our, uh, our network food banks um, to move in similar directions if they haven't already. Great. And, and just be, you know, our last question, and then um, we'll get to Amanda, you had a question in chat, I see, um, that we'll get to. I also think you have one of the best um, placeholders for yourself with that bear picture. Love that. So for my final question, we want to leave our audience with these webinars with very practical takeaways. It's all about building, building their strategies. So what advice would you give a city leader preparing to deal with a food crisis after a natural disaster? If, if there is a food bank uh, system operational in the city, um, the, I, I would advise that they approach uh, that food bank and talk about how they may be able um, to engage in a, in a formal way. Recognize that there are short and long-term phases, response and recovery, um, and, and talk with the food bank about um, the relevant private sector companies that are likely to engage in a response uh, effort and plan for how the city and the food bank can work together with um, those private sector resources that are gonna be so critical to, to the response. Create an agreement um, and, and make sure that in that agreement, you're, you're looking at not just managing the, the um, the solicitation and collection of, of additional product, but looking at issues like logistics and cost sharing. Um, while the food bank might have the facilities and might have vehicles and be able to, to move product, usually the incredible spike in need and demand um, and activity um, uh, becomes a burden from a cost perspective. And, and, and if the city is able to lean on the private sector and the and the voluntary sector to um, actually deliver and manage some of the response effort, perhaps a role that the city can play is financial support to make that happen. Um, and 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 so they it, instead of instead of the city focusing on building an infrastructure to collect and distribute food, take advantage of the existing infrastructure and just help to facilitate it um, by driving resources to it when it's needed. Great. Well, thanks, Chris. And I think that answers Amanda's question too, which is about um, the role of local governments in it. So really thank you, Chris, for your time. He's going to be sticking around. If we have time at the end, uh, we'll have open questions. Keep popping those into chat. 
But otherwise, we're going to move to Alex. So welcome, Alex. I think, Kelsey, we can just maybe keep up that placeholder slide there um, when you start sharing. So Alex serves as a senior official performing the duties of Deputy Administrator for Resilience at FEMA. And he's gonna draw on his extensive experience as a leader in emergency management and resilience, sharing insights and important lessons learned from all of his roles in federal disasters. So Alex, welcome. We're so glad to have you here and to share that FEMA perspective. We know FEMA undertook just historic mobilization of resources to provide emergency and food and water to Puerto Rico following Hurricane Maria. Um, as, as you do after all hurricanes, but I think it really was historic in that sense. Can you provide some details on the scope of the resources after Maria and what you're still investing in Puerto Rico four years on? Sure. Uh, and thank you. And, and first, uh, thank you and the Food Foundation. Uh, I mean, sharing best practices in food security, I think that that's a very noble uh, work, uh, especially when we're looking and drawing on um, you know, international uh, lessons, because there's always something that we can learn from each other. Uh, relative to Puerto Rico, yeah, Puerto Rico was historic in a number of different areas. Um, it was uh, our largest mobilization ever in our uh, agency's history. Uh, and, and for those that don't know, the Federal Emergency Management Agency uh, is a federal agency, about uh, 25,000 uh, employees that we have. Uh, and uh, our role is uh, at the request of a governor and at the direction uh, of the president, is to support uh, uh, states uh, in disasters. And the, the construct that we work under uh, is that in emergencies, they are uh, uh, responses locally uh, executed. Uh, it's managed at the state level uh, and it's supported by the, the federal government. Uh, Puerto Rico was very unique in that uh, it literally stood at the crossroads of a extraordinarily powerful storm uh, and, uh, uh, an aged uh, infrastructure, uh, a very vulnerable infrastructure. Uh, and that caused uh, a, a very uh, complex disaster uh, like we've not seen before, uh, because it wasn't just uh, the power grid that went down, it was the water system, it was communications, uh, it was uh, even in government at the uh, state and municipal level uh, were also impacted. And so that added some complexities uh, to an island uh, uh, that uh, also had a you know, high uh, uh, rate of people with disabilities, a high rate of uh, elderly uh, folks, uh, a high uh, rate of poverty. Uh, and, and uh, you know, the, the historic part was uh, the mobilization of about uh, $2 billion worth of just uh, food and water that was brought in onto the island. I think uh, the statistic within the first uh, 30 days, we averaged about 600,000 uh, meals uh, per day uh, that were uh, on island. It was also the largest mobilization that we had of generators and generation capacity uh, on the power grid, the largest emergency power mission, uh, about 2.4 billion just to get the power grid back up in a temporary way, uh, uh, up and running. Um, and, and, and so that added to the complexity. When it comes to food, it itself, um, you know, what was important to us, I think, as Chris mentioned, was, you know, we knew day to day people were receiving food or food assistance through uh, networks. Uh, it was important for us to be able to tap into those networks as quick as possible and as quick as those networks could get back to up and running uh, to be able to support them along with the development of new networks. And, and that was the strategy that we had uh, early on. Obviously, uh, the lack of communication, uh, the terrain, uh, you know, Puerto Rico uh, has a, uh, for those that don't know the topography, uh, you has a, a, a mountain range, uh, Cordillera Central, uh, that goes through the, the island. Uh, and you have communities that, you know, on any given day, it's tough to get to, uh, much less uh, uh, after disaster with the sheer number of mudslides that uh, really uh, left areas uh, inaccessible. Uh, and, and, and there we had to use the uh, air transport, you know, and helicopters to be able to uh, drop ship uh, and land in, in baseball stadiums uh, across the island. Uh, and so uh, a very complex disaster. Um, what we continue to do there, uh, 
Puerto Rico will be uh, the largest uh, single disaster investment uh, in our agency's uh, history, uh, surpassing Hurricane Katrina uh, and Hurricane Sandy combined. Uh, uh, our investment just in the power grid uh, alone, uh, we've obligated last year, largest project in our agency's history at uh, uh, $9.5 billion uh, in federal dollars uh, for the power grid. We've also uh, uh, supported the uh, water system uh, to the tune of about $4.1 billion and the education system to uh, uh, 1,000 schools, uh, which also serve as a place for uh, food for residents uh, in, in a tune of $2.3 billion. So the, the top one, two, and three projects in our agency's history are, are in the island of Puerto Rico. That's amazing. And, and again, we have some of that data in case you missed all of those amazing data points from Alex. We have some of those captured in our, our case study as well. But, but thanks, Alex. It really is uh, an incredible investment in, in Puerto Rico from FEMA. Um, a lot was created uh, by, by all parties. They had to invent right when, when you're in these these uh, catastrophic situations. You created two things in your response, FEMA did, um, to assess and support local food systems. One was the business emergency operations centers and the other was the food availability index. Could you tell us more about these strategies? Yeah, uh, you know, one, if you're part of emergency management, part of your DNA is figuring out uh, how did you do and how do you do better? I mean, that's what we do here every day. Uh, in the terms of how we do better um, in, in, in reviewing uh, all that existed on the island, it was clear uh, that we could have taken more advantage of resources that already existed on the island, as opposed to bringing everything in. Uh, in emergency management, there's a, there's, a, um, there's a dance and there's a tension between uh, local supply chains that exist and what you're bringing in. Important to uh, us as a federal agency first is that, you know, that people receive emergency assistance, life-sustaining assistance. That's the most important. Uh, but as we move and progress in a disaster, uh, it's important to get the local economy working again, get your stores open again, uh, the normal places where people get food, making them uh, uh, accessible and available. Uh, that's the, 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 the long-term game. That's where you want to get where it's now self-sustaining with less support that's needed. Uh, and you can uh, understand that when we, the an influx of $2 billion in food uh, on an island that's 100 by 35 makes a significant impact to that local economy. You wanna get that economy uh, back and running. So to that end, uh, with the uh, Business Emergency Operations Center, it was our sense of let's get connected with uh, the private sector. Um, it, it, disasters, it, it's all about partnerships and it's not about the federal government. And any uh, disaster that is 100% uh, federal response will fail. Uh, it's about partnerships with the private sector nonprofits uh, and other sectors uh, to ensure that together we're working the problem uh, and shrinking the problem. Uh, in, 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 in that sense, the Business Emergency Operations Center was invitation to private sector to be at the table to understand what's arriving, what's not, where gaps are, how they can support an operation uh, in, in any way that they can, if they have transportation, if they have dock space and, and the like. And then the second on the a food index, important to us is also to understand uh, where are there pockets of maybe underserved populations uh, and, uh, and looking at access to food, all right? Uh, and, it is a, um, an index that overlays uh, the social vulnerability index, uh, SOVI, uh, some of you may know, uh, but it is a composite measure of uh, disability, uh, income, socioeconomic, uh, I think 16 different factors, uh, composite measure, uh, where, and overlays with, uh, with where there are open and closed uh, stores, uh, grocery stores. Uh, and not just a large uh, 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 grocery chain, uh, but also you know small uh, independent uh, stores as well. Uh, and in overlaying those two, then we can look at uh, where is assistance most needed uh, and how we can uh, affect change by targeting 
uh, those areas. That that's that's great, and I think you know that that will be a. We're considering that for another whole case study. It's so interesting in that partnership. How you know another key takeaway of this webinar series, and as we were developing with Food Foundation, is planning that make sure to account for multiple disasters simultaneously, right? People had the pandemic and natural disasters, and we see natural disasters upon natural disasters, which Denise will talk about. But FEMA, that was a historic year in 2017 because of the number of ca catastrophes you had to deal with. How has FEMA adapted to that? What lessons have been learned there? Yeah, um, well, first, uh, you know, it's very obvious that our climate is changing and um, the uh, storms are becoming much more frequent, much more uh, intense, um, and uh, are more costly. And, and that uh, is empirical uh, 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 data supported uh, across the board. Just, uh, just last week or earlier, just on Sunday, uh, I think, uh, excuse me, Saturday, uh, we had a, a rash of tornadoes uh, in December go through Kentucky uh, because a uh, unusual uh, warm air that uh, it was in the uh, uh, atmosphere and intensified the storms. Unfortunately, uh, uh, you know a large, large loss of life uh, as a result of climate change. 2017 uh, was in particularly uh, uh, busy uh, because we started uh, uh, the year with uh, fires in uh, wildfires in the uh, uh, western coast uh, in California. Um, uh, eliminating towns, uh, literally uh, walls of flame uh, traveling 80 miles per hour. Uh, that's how intense uh, it was and left uh, tens of thousands of people uh, displaced. Uh, in August of that year, had a category four or five storm uh, in Harvey that went onto the coast of uh, Texas um, and then uh, sat over uh, uh, the city of Houston and dropped uh, 60 inches of rain. Uh, it, 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 a couple weeks later, uh, a, a Hurricane Irma uh, going through the Virgin Islands and part of Puerto Rico uh, uh, through the Florida Keys and uh, making landfall on the western side of Florida, a category four, five storm uh, back to back. Uh, and then uh, three weeks later, uh, you had uh, a, a Hurricane uh, Maria, which was a catastrophic, equally uh, you know, kind of uh, damaging all of Puerto Rico and what was spared by Irma uh, uh, in the Virgin Islands was just run over uh, by Hurricane uh, Maria. And so we recognize that uh, any one of those events was a Hurricane Katrina that would mobilize all of the national resources. And so we have to plan for not what happened in the past, uh, but for future conditions. And our agency is pivoting to, and working with uh, uh, NOAA, uh, our National Oceanic and, At Oceanic and Atmospheric Agency, uh, on the uh, predictions of future forecasts based off of uh, the changing climate uh, and what we're to expect. Uh, but we are also mobilizing uh, state and local governments to do the same, uh, along with the nonprofits and private sector. It really is a all hands on deck uh, and a recognition that with larger uh, storms, more frequent storms, uh, higher intensity, uh, we have to expand the team uh, and we have to be prepared, uh, you know, going down to the individual uh, family community level. And that, that's really that's really great, Alex. Thanks for that. And, and really interesting that you're partnering more closely with NOAA as you think about future predictions. Um, they're also an amazing organization. So um, as with Chris, I just wanna finish uh, your interview by asking your advice to city leaders. I think some leaders expect their federal government's emergency management association to just take, take it over. So they're off the hook. What would your response be to that? Yeah, that's, uh, no, that's not right, right? <laughs> if you're a local official, uh, you have responsibilities and your responsibilities as being elected uh, is to uh, do everything to prepare uh, your population, right? And so there's something for you to do uh, as well at the state level. And again, uh, federal government will be a support to that, but we have to have a, a partner to connect to at the state level and at the local level. For local leaders, you know your community best. So you've got an advantage uh, and understand what exists within your respective city. Uh, understand where there is food 
because it doesn't make sense to bring something from outside when it's in your backyard. Uh, and so very important to be able to document and bring those, those players to the table now while there's not a disaster to be able to have a discussion about how will we best utilize resources that exist at the local level. Remember, at the local level, it's so much faster. You can save so much more uh, lives. You can change outcomes by being prepared and being partnered, having those plans now, and then know that if the disaster exceeds your capacity, then you'd have your state and the federal government to be able to support. But start local. Uh, you know, they, they say uh, disasters uh, begin and end at the local level. Uh, and so begin that That's planning uh, now while you can. Oh, well said. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. That's wonderful. Uh, really, thank you for your time. And now, uh, again, great segue, because now we're going to hear about really at the local level, Denise, who's going to talk about uh, the food bank and their response and, and, and really how that local level was, was brought in, what, what some of the challenges were with local government and how the, the food bank reacted. She now serves as the president of the Puerto Rico Food Bank, and she's going to share her experiences in managing uh, emergency food following Hurricane Maria and other disasters in Puerto Rico, because it didn't end there for Puerto Rico. She's had 30 years working in key leadership roles in Fortune 500 companies. Uh, so we, we welcome Janice. Thank you. We're just thrilled to have you join us and share your experiences of being on the ground, um, again, at that local lo level. Perhaps we could start by having you share your perspective on the role the food bank played after the hurricane in general. Give us a little bit of sense of that. Oh, yes. Uh just, I want to thank uh, the Food Foundation, and uh, I just want to recommend our uh, participants to refer back to the case study. I think it's a very well uh, prepared, very uh, good summary of uh, what happened and the things that can uh, be uh, thought about and planned around uh, when uh, dealing with a disaster. Uh, the food bank was, uh, I would say, a, a, an unknown entity. We have uh, been uh, working in Puerto Rico uh, it, since 1988, uh, but it was a very um, low profile, a very uh, low profile uh, operation. And uh, we basically distributed around 10 million uh, pounds of food every year through a network of around 145 agencies around the island. Uh, right after Maria, um, we soon realized that uh, we had to have uh, the government you know, bring us into their network because the government was uh, fairly new. They, with the administration was only nine months. It was a lot of young people uh, that really didn't have the experience of living through a catastrophic hurricane. So right after Maria, they, they, they sort of uh, got uh, totally uh, confused and totally uh, gone. And uh, we had to start, you know, uh, tying ties uh, with the government and letting them know that the food bank was there and that we had the logistics in place, we had the people in place. Uh, it took us uh, uh, only 36 hours to basically put a, a, a crew uh, in place, and we started uh, basically distributing uh, food to very few uh, agencies because you have to realize that with the catastrophic impact of Maria, um, as Chris, um, Christopher mentioned, uh, a lot of our agencies were not operating. Uh, a lot of their uh, installations were either gone or very uh, damaged. Uh, there was a lot of obstacles trying to get through uh, around the island. Uh, uh, this with regards to you know um, a land uh, transportation, there was no electricity. There was uh, no a uh, very few uh, cellular uh, companies were operating. There was very low fuel, uh, so it, it was a it was the the scenery of, a, of the perfect storm. It, so uh, finally, we got the government's attention because Puerto Rico was receiving a lot of. Uh, food uh, donations. Uh, th there was food donations coming from all over the place, but we did not have the infrastructure at the time to be able to handle all those, uh, all those trailers coming in. So they were ba being uh, basically stored at the ports and the ports didn't have the, uh, the people and the logistics ready to be able to manage the, um, 
moving those trucks or those trailers, you know, to different uh, organizations that could handle the uh, unloading and the dispatch and, and, and the uh, categorizing of all the food items. Uh, so uh, we were able to come in, we were able to set up uh, in a very inadequate uh, facility, I, I have to say, uh, we're able to set up uh, distribution uh, teams and uh, they work, uh, they uh, divided the island in different regions and they basically set up uh, the uh, distribution uh, uh, distribution channels uh, to all these distant places. We had issues because uh, there was a, a lot of despair, there was a lot of need. You have to realize that in Puerto Rico, around 80% of the food that, that we consume is brought from outside. So um, the uh, stores were closed. So people were, were really desperate uh, trying to, to get food. So the mayors of the cities would come to the food bank and they would try you know, to, to start um, uh, uh, moving the priorities or shifting the priorities so that we could take care of the of the areas there was really not a good map of uh, how the island uh, was uh, um, distributed with regards to how the, the food was going to get there from a government's perspective uh, it was very difficult to determine because of the lack of communications who really needed what and uh, at in the process, we realized, uh, and this is one, one of the things that, that, that um, Alex brought up, so we realized that we were uh, basically visiting uh, some places, you know, over and over when there were other areas that were not being uh, assisted at all because there was really not uh, a good um, logistics interaction with the different organizations that were providing food. So we were, we were moving into places where there were, had already been uh, agencies uh, providing support and we were leaving, you know, areas that were probably very closer to, to our place, you know, totally uh, un, un, untended for because uh, we didn't know uh, w where the priorities were and how was the food distribution uh, t uh, guided uh, through an, um, an umbrella of government uh, overseeing. And, and so in the case study, um, which is based on an interview with you, you talked a bit about the grid system that you use to figure out the need, which we thought was really innovative, right? Because this is one of the biggest problems in disasters when all communication is down. And how do you know where to give the eat? And we saw this in the pandemic, right? Some households getting more than they needed other households going without. So tell us about that grid system. In the, in the, in the process, uh, we soon realized that we had to figure out a better way of, uh, of uh, uh, taking care and impacting you know, the areas that really uh, needed help. So with the help of uh, uh, Puerto Rico BOA, which is the, uh, an, um, an organization made of NGOs and uh, private organizations that come in and they get together you know, right after a disaster. And uh, we had, prior to Maria, we had distributed the island in uh, eight different regions. This is from the food bank perspective. So we had identified, you know, key agencies that had the capabilities, they had the uh, vehicles, the resources to be able to handle a food distribution uh, to get it from the food bank closer to uh, the their uh, pop, the immediate populations. So we had uh, already we had that identified. What we didn't think about was the amount of destruction that was going to happen with Maria. So some of those sites uh, were not operating. Uh, we couldn't communicate uh, with them. So one of the things that we really didn't plan for was distributing enough food beforehand. You know, we, we had everything all set up uh, so that uh, we would start uh, distributing right after the storm, but we didn't, uh, take into consideration the many obstacles that would be uh, presented right after the storms. Uh, I would say that the, the issues during the storm are, are, are one, which is uh, damage control and trying to, to prevent uh, the loss of life. But really the big problem after this is after the disaster is the recovery process. It can take a long, long time. Uh, it will present you with a lot of challenges. And, and this is one of the things that we really found out that we had a great grid, we had everything uh, that worked fine on paper, but when the actual uh, situation came in, 
uh, there were a number of uncontrollables we have not accounted for that should have been taken into consideration. And how much, you talk about how long the recovery process um, has taken. Can you talk about food insecurity and sort of the growth of the food bank from pre-hurricane and now? Well, um, <clears throat> Puerto Rico has been in a crisis state for the last, uh, I would say, uh, four years. I mean, we started with Maria. Uh, we have not gotten uh, uh, totally recovered uh, from Maria. Uh, actually, we had two storms. We had Irma, which was 10 days after Maria, and then we had Maria. So we had uh, issues that had not been uh, um, resolved and settled you know, with Irma. And 10 days, we're facing you know, the most ca catastrophic uh, uh, hurricane in, in I don't know how many years. So uh, it, it took us a long time. I mean, we had people that were almost one year without electricity. And this was a, a, a patching of the electric system. It was not really uh, state of the art uh, by no ways. Uh, so we continue having a lot of infrastructure uh, issues. Uh, so we are working to, to basically uh, try to resolve Maria's issues. And then we are uh, faced with uh, uh, a number of earthquakes in the Southern uh, part of Puerto Rico, about 15 uh, municipalities were, were um, impacted seriously a lot of uh, we lost a lot of, of houses and a lot of uh, a lot of property a lot of these people had to move out of their uh, houses they were either afraid or they couldn't live in, in those houses and they had to move to either parks or uh, public uh, arenas uh, so that they uh, and there were tents set up so that they could uh, live through uh, that period it, it, it has been a long period with the earthquakes it, they they continue um, I would say that people are getting a, a little bit more used to, you know, the fact that they can happen anytime, and we continue having them, and uh, we are still dealing with the hurricanes, I mean, with the earthquakes when, you know, the pandemic comes in. So it has been one right after the other. Puerto Rico before uh, Maria was uh, about uh, one third of the population uh, um, suffered from food insecurity especially in the central uh, areas of the island and in the southern coast. Uh, about uh, one third of the population experienced uh, food insecurity at, at any one given point. Um, with uh, Maria, uh, the food insecurity almost skyrocketed to, to close to 60%. I mean, uh, and it was not, not because of, of lack of uh, resources, it was lack of uh, the instruments to be able to get food, for example, and this is something uh, that people don't think about. But with the, uh, the lack of electricity, uh, a lot of, our, uh, of uh, the food stores were closed. But the banking system did not work. Credit cards did not work. The ATH did not work. So everything that had to be bought uh, and all the services had to be paid in cash. I mean, and there was a, a so all of a sudden, you know, a lot of people uh, did not have enough cash uh, to last them for, uh, Two, two months, for example, and a lot of retailers, you know, sort of uh, hooked on to the fact that uh, they, there was no um, a banking system. And they started, uh, even though they had electricity, they started uh, basically charging cash for all their goods. So that was one big, big problem. The other big problem was um, gasoline, uh, fuel. Mm -hmm. uh, our, uh, there were very few fuel stations that were up and running right after Maria. With the um, uh, the fuel was basically uh, not ration, but it was um, sort of uh, FEMA so decided, you know, to, to ration um, uh, the fuel so that their vehicles could get to uh, resolving, you know, bigger uh, issues. But that uh, created a, a big problem for for uh, most of the population because they did, they could they did not have places where they could get fuel. Uh, so that they could go to the stores or go to whenever they had uh, to, to buy some food. So it was just a lot of uh, a lot of issues. Uh, there was uh, very few communications. So mm -hmm. uh, even getting to know where the uh, food stores were located, uh, food stores that were in operation was another hindrance. So uh, a lot of things contributed to bringing the the uh, food uh, 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 insecurity uh, levels to around sixty percent. We have been working in lowering that, and I believe that it's a little bit, it's it's much more manageable at this point in time. 
but Puerto Rico, because Puerto Rico is a, 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 a country with a very high uh, poverty rate, uh, there is a lot of food insecurity and, and about uh, um, one, uh, 30% still of the population uh, suffers from food insecurity. Food insecurity. Thank you for that, Denise. Um, that's really helpful. And just very quickly, because we're, we're at, almost out of time here, but, but what is the one thing you would tell city leaders that they should do? Oh, the, the first thing is they have to have an emergency plan. And uh, it's interesting because everybody has the emergency plan. Nobody read the emergency plan. They, they wrote <laughs> the emergency plan and they put it in the drawers, you know. And all of a sudden right. there was an emergency and they forgot where it was. Uh, as, as a matter of fact, it was very interesting. The government uh, said that uh, there were no uh, emergency plans. There were emergency plans, but the government officials were new, forgot. They're inexperienced. They didn't know well. Uh, how to go about, you know, uh, looking for the emergency plan. So I do recommend that, that a good emergency plan be, be prepared, that it be shared with, you know, all of your uh, stakeholders, uh, that you have drills, you know, um, if to, to practice, you know, the issues. Uh, you have to set up partners so that you know where you're going to get the fuel when, when you're in need, so that you know where you, you have to go through you know, to, to get uh, your shipments in, how will you process the documentation? I mean, there are all sorts of uh, what, what you would believe are very small details, but these very small details really become the key issues to solve whenever there is a disaster. So have a good, um, a good plan. plan. The good thing, the other thing is, uh, think about after the, uh, the disaster. Most of the people plan for the period during the disaster, but it's that is not the worst of the time. The worst time comes after the disaster when you have to deal with probably uh, six to eight weeks of continuous uh, issues coming up. Great. Well, thank you for that. Um, and we're going to go back to our screen sharing, but that's exactly right. The, the very small details some, sometimes come the big issues and uh, uh, plans are not useful if people don't remember where they are and uh, they're not dynamic and reviewed. So with that, we're getting close to the end. This was an amazing discussion. Um, any feedback from you, you can drop into chat or share with Florence. Her, her email is, is shared here on the screen. Um, any feedback from you? I thought this was an amazing discussion. I think of it as a master class. I know this has always been, uh, we live in this world and to have the perspective of both FEMA and the food banks and an expert like Chris all in one place for the hour is just an incredible perspective. So I wanna thank all of you. Uh, did you like the format where we interviewed instead of had people present? Did you think it was too long, too short? Let us know, we're always trying to improve these webinars. Food Foundation is, you know, they have another webinar series after this as well. So please let us know about that either now in chat or, or after. Kelsey, if we could go to the next, great, uh, next slide. Yeah, would you like to ask the speaker? So we just wanna um, have, you know, get people engaged. We have about five minutes left for the first hour. And I think some of the speakers can hang out around if you have other questions. Um, would you like to ask them about how they might address specific food issues in, in your city and what you're seeing there as well? Um, great. We heard some real information, and I think that's Kumari from Venezuela. Uh, great. Denise, you're getting a shout out there in the chat if you can see that. Uh, Elizabeth, are there any suggestions about how to expand your capabilities for refrigeration? This is really interesting question and um, this cold storage idea. And Chris, I think your response to us is it's about more shelf stability than refrigeration, but maybe you wanna take that. Yeah, the, the part of the issue is that so often um, power becomes a really serious um, problem. And, and even if the food bank or other uh, facilities that are collecting and distributing product are able to arrange for power by having a generator or whatever. The reality is most of the people at home uh, who are going to be receiving the food will not have power. And so it's, um, it's, it's more important to focus on, on shelf stable uh, product. Um, perhaps fresh fruits and vegetables, because in, in, in so, some cases, 
you can keep uh, that product without refrigeration for, for less time, but it's still for um, some adequate time for consumption. Uh, so it's best to avoid uh, the need for refrigeration and, and freezing in, in particular um, uh, in response and, and focus on products that don't require that. That's great. Thanks, Chris. That's Denise, did you want to add or did I hear? No, that, that, that is one of the big biggest issues. Uh, we have uh, uh, generators, but uh, it's for us, it's, it's really the, the issue of, uh, or was the issue of getting enough uh, fuel to have uh, the gener generators going, you know, going uh, because the, we had the, um, the freezers and the um, uh, coolers uh, working, but it was very unstable. Uh, and uh, at one point in time, we decided that we were we did not want anything frozen because it was it was going to go bad anyway. And uh, as uh, as I agree with Chris, uh, most of the people did not have uh, refrigerators, so it was just a waste of time. Yeah, great. Okay, Kelsey, maybe we can just move to the last slide as we continue to get some great questions in chat. We just want to, as we start to move into, again, we're going to keep the conversation going. We have another whole hour. Um, if you want to hang out, anyone, uh, feel free to do so. But we want to officially thank you for participating. Uh, great link there, all the presentations, additional resources. Please share with your colleagues, share with others. Uh, we build the resources to be really evergreen. Uh, we curate them. You know, It's not all the resources out there. We try to pick those that are most relevant to everyone. Our next webinar is January 12th at uh, 1400 GMT, so in the new year. And this is going to be emergency food plans in the context of chronic food insecurity, which is really as challenging as a catastrophic natural disaster. And with that, we're just going to close it out officially and move to the follow-up discussion. So we'll be able to answer all questions popping up in chat. Uh, but Florence, if you want to just thank everyone, and we'll try to formally close it out the presentations. Right. Yeah, thank you, Kim. And, and thank you to Kim and Kelsey so much for your organization. Many thanks to all of the speakers for their excellent inputs. It's been a really, really interesting discussion. Um, and I can see we've got some great questions coming in through the chat. So I've put the link a few times in the chat now to uh, head to our platform to explore um, the resources and, and to visit the platform. So I'll just drop that in there uh, once more. Um, and we'd love to hear uh, hear back from you on, on how you found the webinar, on on your um, your thoughts on the platform. And we do hope that you join us for the next webinar in the series. Um, and you can find more information about that on the platform as well. Um, and yes, please do stick around for the um, conversation if you uh, are able to for the next hour. So thanks very much, everyone. Back to you, Kim. Thanks, Florence. Uh, we had a question from Sarah Kuster about, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, but is there a directory collection of local emergency food plans? That's what we're trying to pull together uh, for our final webinar. We want to have that as, as the resources um, that we put up uh, on the learning platform resources for the Food Foundation. We're also going to cross post them to the Feeding Cities group. And I can tell you not a lot of really, really uh, food-centric emergency uh, plans there, but we continue to look. So if you have any suggestions, send, send them our way. Um, in the, we know the Milan Urban Food Policy Pack, which we'll hear from in our final webinar too. They have some, Milan certainly has been developing um, a really robust emergency plan. Um, as well as Birmingham has been working on, on one as well and in the US. Uh, North America, um, we we helped develop something for for Toronto, and and when the pandemic came, I think they they've certainly added to that. What other questions do we have, Kelsey, popping up, or Florence? Yeah, we've got somebody wondering um, <clears throat> about the possibility without without electricity and water, um, actually preparing food. Did that become an issue for people? Um, although I'm not sure if we have anybody left in the room who can answer that. <laughs> I think Chris could. Um, oh, Chris, absolutely. There you are, Chris. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, I there are there are some food bank systems that I'm aware of who have stockpiled um, uh, ma materials like water um, specifically for disaster response. They're in they're in areas where um, disasters are um, pretty much a guarantee that they're going to happen um, every year. 
and and so they stockpile resources. I'm thinking of of one of the food bank systems in uh, southern India, which experiences a lot of flooding, and they're in the midst of a lot of flooding right now. Um, and they actually operate their own kitchens and they stockpile resources um, to be able to prepare meals for distribution uh, to the um, response effort um, in, in uh, southern India. Um, some food banks in the United States do similar kinds of things. In some yeah. cases, um, they dedicate a, a part of their warehouse and, and actually um, uh, hold on to food and water um, anticipating the next disaster to, to come up. And sometimes that is product that they have solicited themselves from their regular donor base. And sometimes it's coming from uh, state or county or, or city government um, funding the purchase of food that they store in the food bank waiting for um, the need to deploy it uh, to a response effort. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Chris. It, well, that, that, that was pretty much it. Oh, sorry. Sorry to cut you off. Um, yeah. And, and you know, it, what, what's the current sort of best practice um, in trying to prepare for this is that you map all of your food assets in your city. So thinking about your food trucks and you see a lot of celebrity chefs, right? And restaurants coming to bear in these situations and having some sense of those assets that can be leveraged um, after a disaster. So um, we've seen that, we saw that in Puerto Rico. Kelsey, maybe you can drop that in chat, the, um, yeah. the Jose Andres. Um, All right, um, the world. Uh, the I always world forget food. the name, Chris. Yeah, yeah. World, world food something. So, so Kelsey's gonna drop it in there. Um, which we've been going over the past few weeks. I always forget it. So, so we have these chefs coming together, and but food trucks too, where you have these uh, food trucks that do lunch or or dinners, et cetera. These really are ready mobile food uh, preparation. They can be be leveraged in emergencies and often do a really great job, especially for culturally appropriate food, which yeah. is hugely important. And, and I know in the question. United States, I, I don't know if it still functions um, this way today, because as I as I said before, I'm not really directly involved in disaster response um, anymore uh, here in the US. But <clears throat> as part of National VOAD, um, I, I, there's a great picture. I wish that I had a copy of it that ju just showed the collaboration between groups. So the, it was in one of the uh, in response to one of the hurricanes in, in Florida. Um, some years ago, where the food bank truck and the Southern Baptist um, mobile kitchen and the Red Cross ERVs for distribution were all parked together. And it, and it was just a great pic, pic, picture of collaboration where the food bank was providing the resources, the, the food and the, and the beverages. They were being put into these big trailers that the Southern Baptists um, uh, operate, which were just mobile kitchens, and they were pumping out tens of thousands of meals a day using the food from the food bank, and the prepared meals were going into the Red Cross vehicles to be driven out and dispersed in the neighborhoods uh, in the affected area. It was just a wonderful um, uh, pictorial example of, of how uh, organizations collaborate with each other. Great anecdote. Kelsey, what else do we have? And again, it's not just Chris and our speakers that respond. All of you are experts and all of you have great perspectives. So we want this to be a, as much of a conversation as possible. Go ahead, Kelsey. Yeah, I'm not seeing any more questions, but we are getting some great comments about um, some work that's being done in Florida to sort of integrate food banks into um, other infrastructure um, studies conducted uh, looking at grocery stores and pharmacies that might be out of power if there's a storm surge. Um, so I'm not sure if anybody wants to elaborate on that. Yeah, great. Elizabeth, I think. Elizabeth Dunn, if you want to share your work, it sounds a lot um, like some of the work that we've done. Yeah, so locally, we're trying to figure out ways that we can um, build that network and understand, especially using like GIS, like where are um, our, our potential fail points and how do we make sure using like the... Uh, food gap maps and um, understanding where that vulnerability is with the, the social vulnerability index and so forth, where the overlay of those 
those potential businesses could be out on top of um, there being like food deserts or uh, populations that are underserved or may need um, have a high demand. So um, in addition, before her, uh, the pandemic, we did start adding all the food banks into the, EO, or the web EOC platform so that we can determine, like they can go in there, they would log in and they would give like daily updates on their status. And if they needed to collaborate with a, a food bank in a local area, then they could say, hey, my refrigeration went out. Can I move my food to your facility? Um, you know, and then the, of course, like a month later, the pandemic hit. So we're trying to pick that back up and expand it to other counties in the Tampa Bay area. Great. Could you just introduce yourself, like where you sit and your oh, role? Yeah, and sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, my name is Elizabeth Dunn. I'm at the University of South Florida. Um, I am a faculty there in disaster management, um, specifically in the College of Public Health. Um, so I look at planning um, from a population standpoint, um, and I work very closely with um, each of the counties in the Tampa Bay area. That's great, Elizabeth. We should connect after this as well. Great. Um, who who else? What other comments do we have? We have a new question um, about um, somebody wondering about the role of state and local public health departments in helping mm. communities develop emergency food plans. This is, is a, a great, great question. question. Chris, I can answer this question unless you have a perspective on it as well. No, go right ahead. Okay, so this is really interesting. The, the where food emergency plans and where food plans reside in city really vary city to city. And um, so we partnered with uh, the city of Toronto's public health department, for example, on their food food plan, their, their resilient food plans. I don't think Barbara's on here. Usually she's able to attend. Barbara Emanuel was head of that, that food program there and that's who we worked with. Um, and, and just talking to them more recently, right? That's both a strength and a weakness depending on sort of what public health gets drawn into. Um, in different situations. So for example, they were they had a great perspective on food and were able to integrate in you know public health concerns into the emergency food plans, had a really broad perspective. When the pandemic hit, the food team was all seconded to dealing with pandemic and and, and vaccines, et cetera, uh, to really address that public health crisis as well. So um, we see a very varied role of where state and, and local public health can be involved. Uh, would love to hear from others. You can drop it in chat, uh, what we're seeing in, in other countries or even in the US. Anyone else have a perspective on where public health, local state public health agencies have, have been involved? Great. I mean, what it comes down to is just the, the capacity and interest of, of public health um, and those above public health in terms of that. Sarah, I think you had a question on what's the ideal makeup of partners in a community to develop an emergency food plan. That is such a fantastic question. Uh, we're going to address that question head on in our fifth webinar where we'll talk about that. Um, certainly through our research, we know it's a, it's a very varied group. We've heard from Puerto Rico and all of our webinars talk about public and private, but we'd love to hear from all of you on the call. Chris, if you have a perspective as well, and Florence, who should be, a, who should be involved in developing an emergency food plan? We yeah, know it's more I, than the government. Go ahead, exactly. Chris. Exactly. Absolutely more than the government. Um, uh, I, I believe that the broader um, the involvement that you can make, the better the plan that you're going to have. And more importantly, the better likelihood you're going to have for exercising the plan um, when it actually comes around. I think, I think that Denise had made mention of the fact that, of, of the, I, I think she said it was the city of San Juan had done a great job pulling together a plan that went on a shelf and everybody forgot what it said. Um, when they when they really needed it, um, and the broader the broader the stakeholder base that you include in doing the plan, the better assurance that you have that it's going to be uh, uh, executed when when the time comes. Um, I think that it needs to include absolutely government and probably several different um, departments within government focused around 
um, procurement and acquisition and logistics management and health and um, and uh, human services. Um, and it needs to involve uh, the NGOs that can be involved in, in deploying the food. So the food bank and, and um, community kitchens and, um, and uh, um, nonprofit logistics support organizations. Um, and, uh, and it needs to include the private sector, food companies yeah. um, and trades associations of, of food companies. Um, who will be able to quickly, who will be able to commit in the planning process um, to certain levels of engagement, um, but then more importantly, be able uh, when the time hits and the, and the, the response is needed um, to be able to mobilize the partners who, uh, who are part of their, um, their trade associations or part of their segments of industry um, that are relevant for uh, making the food available both yeah. donated food as well as um, purchased food. Yeah, that's a great point. And, uh, you know, as we've studied this for the last decade or so, right, a, a, a couple of things. Food is not, the people that come to the planning table for food, it's not just public health and it's not just those in the food sector, although they're very important. It is transportation. It's people who are involved with fuel. It's people involved with logistics. It's the utilities, the power utilities. So when we develop these emergency food plans in cities, that's who comes to the table as well as the private sector. The pro one of the first concerns we hear from cities is the private sector doesn't want to play. We have never found that. The private sector is very willing to come to the table to help understand how they can help. They want better communications to make sure they can be up and running as well. They want the direct communications to utilities, roads, et cetera, um, as well as then the food bank sector, as Chris said, um, and I think Denise, they have these really trusted relationships with the food bank already, so they already know each other. Um, it's this really varied group, and, and this is on our very first slide for this webinar series. This was one of the motivations that we came to, uh, right, and the food bank or the food foundation as well. So what happens when you don't have a plan in place, the government tries to go it alone. They're scrambling, right? They have a natural disaster. They're trying to figure everything out at once. They scramble to solve the emergency food situation as well. They're not often involving everyone that needs to be involved. They're not trying to align it with their broader sustainability, environmental goals, et cetera. So the more that you can have the right people at the table, this broad, base at the table to develop the plan, the better it's going to be executed, it will be more efficient, more effective on the back end. And that is our biggest takeaway and the biggest motivation for this. Would you agree, Florence and Shaleen? Maybe you want to add Yes. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. I was just going to um, add to, to much of what's gone before, um, you know, very much based on, on mapping what you've got available within your city, what the um, uh, what the the assets are within the city in terms of response um like you said you know there's the private sector particularly out of home there's going to be a lot of um, facilities and kitchen spaces that are available um, to help in the response um, and similarly um thinking outside the box like kim said not just within the local authority and in terms of different departments that will be involved but within the city um i live in bristol in the uk and in um the covid response um a, a really important group within the city was um a housing union uh, and they had a lot of members um who were um in living in uh, disadvantaged communities um who are um either amongst or very much uh, connected to the most vulnerable co communities within the city. So they were well placed to know where the need was and to help reach those people within the community and to self-organize um, and connect the food supply with the people in need. So thinking of, and uh, similarly Tonya said in the chat, faith communities need to be involved yeah. as well. So thinking who those key um, organizations within the city are who know where the, the need is going to be and are already embedded within those communities and have networks and structures that can help um, in the response. Yeah, huge. Faith communities, we have we haven't said that directly, so thank you, Tanya, for bringing that up, but you've heard mention of them, the Baptist um, organization in the U.S. that's very large and helps with disasters, but absolutely. I think Elizabeth Dunn, you have your hand up again. This is a person from Florida. Yeah, um, I do have uh, a couple other recommendations, especially for those that are in countries where they have 
mitigation programs. Um, I'm the chair of our local mitigation strategy. So we look at how we can design and, and build up our infrastructure and put in mitigation or, or allocate mitigation dollars to um, our infrastructure and, and improving different aspects of our community. And I'd have to say um, one thing that you could do is figure out ways to build up your food supply chain or your food system by retrofitting buildings or other um, projects that could be especially beneficial for at the community level that could expand your, your food network or your food system. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Elizabeth. And throughout this series, we've, we've heard about um, food is heavy. <laughs> and when you get a lot of donations, you heard that from Denise, they were in very uh, substandard, uh, conditions they had very sort of very quickly rebuilt and um, and expanded their their facilities for food storage. This this was a issue in the pandemic and in much of England, right? Birmingham. We had this great case study where they had to figure out on the fly what buildings had the capacity and could handle the weight of food. Um, they had to be near roads that could handle trucks. They had to be able to handle all the equipment for, for moving food around, right? As Chris said, this is everything that food banks are good at. They just have to double, triple in size, right, during a disaster, and they need to know where those facilities are. Elizabeth, that's a fantastic, right, mitigation. Um, experts often understand where those assets are and have that mapped already. So it's, it's a matter of just pulling together the pieces more, right, often, the different pieces to the puzzle exist, it's pulling them together before the disaster. So you're not trying to do it after the disaster. That's our big point. And, Good. and Any also recognize that it's not just about space for storage, it's about space for manipulation. What one of the one of the things when I was um, with with Feeding America and and part of National VOAD, um, we worked with FEMA to develop guidance for mayors and governors and and um, and other community leaders, uh, you know, when a disaster happens here in the United States, one of the first responses is some radio station or TV station parks a trailer in their parking lot and says, "Bring stuff for the disaster um, uh, victims." And people are bringing food and they're bringing clothes and they're bringing teddy bears and they're bringing all this other stuff that they load up in these trucks and then they consign the trucks to the disaster, um, not to any entity, just to the disaster. And they have no idea of the second disaster that creates. Um, literally um, trucks pull over or are not able to get into the disaster area because it's not consigned to anyone in particular. And, and it's, it's, it's not so common anymore because the country is learning. Um, but back in the early days when, when food banks were getting involved in disaster work, we were going in to pull stuff out of the disaster area, not to put it into the disaster area. Trucks were just dumping stuff on the side of the road because these truck drivers needed to go get another load to, to get paid. Um, and, and so the, the, it's important that there not just be additional warehouse space for, for, um, for products to be moved into, but within that space, there needs to be area for, for sorting um, and for getting the, the, the product that comes in from the public, not so much from the companies, but from the public, uh, sorted and put into usable form that it can be passed on to the response effort. Um, so it's kind of a way station on the way to the response effort um, where that product has, can be sorted out uh, bad product can be discarded, usable product can be categorized and, and, and packaged and, and sent on uh, to the response effort. Yeah, that's a great point. And one of the things we're hearing about, Chris, and have been uh, since we started our work and, and now, you know, the pandemic uh, certainly has, has highlighted it as a reality, but the labor shortage. In a disaster, you have everyone hit. Um, and, and these voluntary sectors that rely on volunteers, they get a lot of volunteers coming in often, but right, everyone's impacted. When you're talking about food and heavy equipment, you need 
people who have experience in a lot of cases licensed to operate heavy equipment. I don't know about you, I couldn't handle a forklift if my life depended on it, right? So you need people who can have the experience with the truck driving, the forklifting, et cetera, and you need to understand who those people are as well. This is something um, that we documented in one of our first case studies in Birmingham, right? Where the organization that all of a sudden they had all this food, they could handle it, they couldn't always find enough labor to manipulate it and, and move it around. That's, a, that's another shortage. Great. Anyone else? I know Elizabeth has her hand up again and wants to share their experiences. Anyone else? Yeah. No, go ahead, Elizabeth. Oh, I was just going to expand on what you just said. We were in a very bad predicament where we set up our pods for food distribution. And nobody Can you explain could... pods, Elizabeth, for those oh, yes. international? Yeah. Yeah, so a pod is a points of um, distribution where you have people drive in to pick up food um, so they don't have to leave their car. You put the food in their trunk or their back seat and they kind of just keep going through so that you can go pretty quickly in, in distributing food. Um, the problem we had is we had these semi trucks with um, food, food on pallets, um, but nobody could uh, manage or work the forklift to like it was a very, very large forklift. Um, and the county government was like, we didn't think about somebody being able to use this equipment. Um, this is pretty like we we have people that can use smaller, you know, um, pieces. But um, what ended up happening is our cert team, we had people that were truck drivers and people that worked out in the fields like that's what they did in their daily job. And they were certified um, and they really, really um, made, you know, uh, the, it, it literally made it it possible yeah. to get the food <laughs> to the people. So, yeah, that's funny. I mean, this is something we have been expounding for years and years and years, and everyone's like, it will never be a problem. Uh, so sadly it, it is become a problem. Um, Kumari, I don't want to call on you or put you on the spot, but you've been very active in chat and, and have a perspective from Venezuela. I just want to see if you want to take a moment to talk about your own experiences. And you brought up this, this idea of the you know, making sure we understand local local farming and how important that is. Uh, yeah, I mean, like when I was in Venezuela, I was obviously acting as a privileged person. I'm actually Canadian. So I had the ability to sort of control my perspective because it, it's really hard to like control emotions, right? So I found that the families had the capacity to create uh, good nutrition plans. And I surveyed 300 or more people in watersheds. So it's like each family farm was compartmentalized in, a, in an entire watershed, which is great planning. It's something that, you know, should have been broadly used and hopefully in the future will be. Um, and they just had the structure to produce far more food than was uh, feeding the markets that were close enough to them. And I did experience hunger in like pretty middle-class families in a city that was about one hour away. So at that time, the fuel shortage was not as it is today. Um, but that's why I said explore walking trade because um, there are uh, really well-known examples in the past when there weren't uh, there wasn't the ability to use fuel. So people were walking or using donkeys where the infrastructure is actually still there. So, which happens in a lot of places, right? The infrastructure is still there. So, and that's just a smaller scale idea, but it's working with the productivity of that area. I'm originally like a forester and a soil scientist, but now I work as an artist, an interdisciplinary artist. In comparison to here, now I'm in Waterloo, my strategy here of survival is being an artist because it's, so interdisciplinary. And um, I think communications is key. Uh, reach out to local artists, especially people who are creating art um, in a perspective that is kind and careful. And um, definitely there's just, it almost from my experience, other than the fact that I, I am not in safe positions a lot of the times when I'm in these communities, and therefore I have to strategically stay out of a lot of issues. Um, I think there's great potential really for food security. And I, I yeah. think it's just a matter of drawing it out. 
Thank you. Well, thanks for joining us and thank you for the thoughtful comments. Anyone else? You know, I think that, you know, it just brings up the point that, um, and Elizabeth has talked about that as well, and Chris, right? Who else? Oh, Elizabeth's on camera. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, anyone else want to talk about, you know, sort of thinking outside the box? Who else? would you involve in your plans? Who else might you think of? Do you know any examples of others that maybe haven't been mentioned? I'll give you some time to think about that. Any surprises, anything new information that you heard on this webinar that you find particularly useful? You know, we always have some real experts who join us. Everyone's feeling shy. Anything new for anyone? I mean, I can share that my current research has been focusing on agri-food supply chains mm -hmm. and how to build your local food system in a way that um, maybe you can integrate maybe your agribusiness a little bit more and getting you know, your, your local farms. So kind of similar to what you were talking about in Venezuela. And so we started an organization through um, some individuals in architecture, which seemed very out of left field. Maybe. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And some farmers where we do these like pop-up it's called lemon graph, but it's, it's these pop-up markets in communities where people can bring their food to sell and exchange and so forth. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's kind of like coming up with like innovative ways to connect the food system or your local food system beyond just, um, you know, maybe, yeah, you know, your your larger kind of food stores. Like, how do you kind of connect local community? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's great. And and in the U.S., and I don't know um, if this was true elsewhere in the world, in the U.S., uh, during the pandemic is the first time in my experience, and again, I've been in the local food system space for, for decades, um, is the first time that CSAs, Community Supported Agriculture, Farmers Markets, the incubators and accelerators that are supporting food entrepreneurs, all of them pivoted really quickly um, and, and started to reallocate food going to institutions, out to households, repackaged it, very, very innovative ways uh, of using those organizations. That's, that's how much demand and in partnership, right, with schools and partnership with the food banks and all the food security network, really innovative. That, that has not been documented enough um, we'll certainly work on that as well. Uh, we got a great question. I'm curious, uh, and, and let's see who that is by. Kelsey, can you see that? Oh, it's, yep, it's from Sarah. She's um, basically asking about um, how much traction there is to get community government officials to see a need for emergency food plans, um, that the buy-in is gonna be really important and how do we make that happen? Sarah, where are you from? If you want to come on camera, I don't know if you feel like coming on camera, you don't have to, maybe late in the day or early for you, but um, this is great. Florence, you may want to take this one as well. So, th th I mean, this is our huge motivation for these webinars. How do we get governments involved? Chris can handle Hi, it as well. Where's Sarah? Why am I not seeing Sarah? Oh, can I have you, my chat box in front of you. Hi, Sarah. Great, great, great Hi. question. Hi. I really enjoyed this uh, presentation. Um, I'm not here actually officially with my work role. I'm here more as curiosity because I think I have it has some connection to our work. But I, I work with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at CDC. Oh, yeah. And we have a division of nutrition, physical activity, and obesity where we uh, work with public health partners on nutrition and physical activity. So emergency food plans... Um, probably has some relevance. We do have Huge. one current funding work that we're doing, building resiliency in communities that's addressing food insecurity. And there's been some discussions about, you know, how communities address emergency needs. So this just seemed up my alley to le learn a little bit more about this. And I'm going to share the link to your site to um, our team lead, just so that oh, they thanks. understand. 
see you as a group and, and and I'm not sure what our role would end up being, but we've seen because of the pandemic, the great need for communities to rally around food insecurity. Yeah, um, that is great. And do you want to, Florence, do you want to take it and then maybe Chris in terms of how successful it's been in Florence, talk about how global you're you're trying to be in addressing getting more governments involved. Yeah, well, I mean, my area of expertise is not emergency food planning, um, but I it's obviously something I'm learning more and more about working with experts like yourself, Kim, um, on this webinar series. Um, and I'm curious, I'm almost, I'd actually quite like to ask you a question. I mean, it seems from my uh, standpoint, particularly living in uh, a developed country in the UK, that emergency food planning is not really something that was on the agenda for a lot of cities um, um, pre-pandemic and that at the moment a lot of those governments um, and local authorities are still in recovery mode and are probably not thinking about planning for the next emergency they're thinking about still recovering from the the current um in emergency that we've just been when been dealing with so is there more or has there been historically more um more thinking around emergency food planning in perhaps uh, whether it's in uh, countries uh, and cities that are more prone to natural disasters um, or in cities that are more prone to, for example, um, our last webinar was on uh, on refugee migration. Um, is there historically more emergency food planning emerging from cities who have faced more, uh, more emergencies? Um, and is it something that more cities are now discussing um, pre uh, post pandemic or are people still in in you know recovery mode from your from your perspective yeah and are you asking me florence from our perspective like what we're seeing or mm. or, yeah and anyone, um, on the call, really. and anyone on the call yeah this is really interesting um i was so passionate about this right i started my own company about three years ago and i can tell you it's mostly foundations who are interested in funding it the cities there are more and more cities saying this is a priority. It still is never top three, I would say. Um, it always sort of falls beneath whatever crisis they're in. Um, I, I think there's a lot, a lot of interest, not much sort of real traction. The human beings, right? We um, put disasters behind us pretty quickly. So as soon as the pandemic is, over, I think people will be on to the, the next sort of growth objective. What we find is it's the cities that have had the near misses that have the most traction because they're not in disaster mode or recovery mode, but they feel like they miss, they were very, very close like Toronto and Boston and New York, right? And, and parts of California that are planning for the earthquakes. It's those cities that, that we find the most traction in. And I think that's true globally as well. But Chris, anyone else on the call want to want to respond to that? Um, yeah, it's it, in terms of, of uh, here in the United States, again, back, it, it's been a while, but back when I was on the board of National VOAD, um, the last uh, couple of years that I was in in that role, uh, we were seeing a, um, a fairly significant uptick in the VOAD concept extending down from the state level down to the local level. And, and you were seeing county level VOADs developing and they were having a fair amount of success. Now this is going back to 2005, 2004. Um, they were having a fair amount of success at the time in um, capturing the attention of county and city uh, governments um, uh, around the whole concept of planning, not just not just emergency food planning, but overall planning for response um, uh, to disasters, and of course that incorporated uh, emergency food planning as part of the as part of the bigger plan. To be honest, I have no idea if it has sustained at that level. There's been lots of changes, obviously, um, from 2005 to today. Um, I have no idea whether it has sustained that to that level, but but what I would attribute the success um, uh, that was happening then to is um, is that whole that whole sense of of collaborative engagement 
that the VOAD movement was uh, promoting, not just collaboration among the NGOs, but collaboration with government, the private sector, uh, and the voluntary sector. Um, and uh, so, so as a strategy for pursuing getting government involved, that's a focus that I see as a natural um, approach. Anyone else globally want to respond to that? Yeah, Elizabeth is saying, I think COVID-19 has shown our government officials the importance of planning. Yes, but Elizabeth, then it'll be the next the next administration and they'll forget all about it, right? That's, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, I've always worked at the intersection of food systems and economic development. And, right, that's like understanding how local officials work and how, right, one of the issues that, one of the biggest challenges, this is globally, is that the, the, the stakeholders in the food system are spread out across local government, right? There's not like a chief food officer. And that's one of our biggest recommendations is you need to have this chief food officer. You need to have a food team somewhere in the government that can act as the point of contact. Ideally, that's around the mayor's office, right? And ideally, or it's public private even better yet because public private can withstand administrative changes in in um, all efforts like in the US for regional economic growth, those that have been most successful over time are the public private partnerships that sit outside of the government but have government represented on it. That allows for changes in, in government officials, changes in their interests, changes in their funding, et cetera. And you have the sustained investment and commitment to that. So we have food policy councils um, all across the world and including in the US, the food policy councils really vary in their mission scope and interest, but a lot of them are very interested in local food systems and developing local food systems instead of thinking about resilience to natural disasters, which is right what, what we try to focus on and build up, right? So yeah, you looked at food policy groups, absolutely. Um, yeah, but I, again, they vary. They yeah, I automatically assume they would probably do the same thing in disasters, but I guess maybe not. No, absolutely okay. not. Yeah, and we can talk about that offline, but any anyone else coming up more global? I know we hear a lot from the U.S. Again, that's part, partly the, the timing of these uh, webinars. Um, nice early morning for us in the U.S. Anyone else? Um, you know, some of you are hanging out being quiet. I can call on a couple of people. Patrick, I, I see you. Not quite, you have a nice picture up. Who else do we have there? Michael, yeah, Patrick. So I'm, um, I'm with Extension, which is the University Extension in Wisconsin. Which you, oh, and Madison, where we're based, Patrick. Are we Madison Extension? That's great. Yes, but I'm in, I'm in the county extension office. So um, Amanda was on here from Brown County. It's something that's being looked at in Brown County. There's a food policy group that's somewhat the motivation behind it. But the other is that during the pandemic, we had some issues with the with the meat manufacturing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the supply chain issues came up um, with the food businesses that we have in Brown County, because we have quite a few of them in, in the Brown County area with uh, food processing. And it came to realize that we don't have necessarily a plan for if there's a food emergency as there has been with the COVID situation. So um, we're new looking into it, haven't found very many examples across the country, but um, this is something that Brown County has at least identified as a something to include in our emergency management plan. A lot of counties right. in particular in Wisconsin have emergency management plans, but they don't necessarily include food as a component of that. Right. Thanks for sharing. Um, I see Dr. Nadaradze on there. Just wondering if you have any anything to share or if you found this interesting. Right. 
I'm just starting to call on some random people who might be on here. Otherwise, we'll probably uh, start to close it out. If anyone else would just like to share I would their interests. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I feel like there's a need to visualize like what a better future will be. Like there's enough research. I think that, I mean, experts agree there's enough research to say that the future is gonna be okay, right? But then it's all about the decision-making, right? Or as you say, the change in power. Um, but murals, murals, like drawing localized visualizations will help maintain people together because like the, the street is what really starts to destabilize people's mm. emotional capacity to agree with each other. And because the media is censored and media is, is, is educated, but the street talk I find, especially when I'm with artists, is very apocalyptic. apocalyptic. Mm -hmm. It's very nihilist. It's, it's very cheap. It's very confrontational. It's very aggressive. Oh, and God. it's just very not unique to anywhere. Like it's, yeah. I've been, it's been the same. Yeah, that's great, Florence coming from the capital of street art. Yeah, it's really amazing. Florence, do you wanna to speak to that? I mean, I don't have anything hugely to add, but yes, Bristol is well well recognized as being one of the street art capitals of, of the world. And it's, it's, a huge, uh, it's a hugely unifying thing with our city. Everyone identifies with it and you see all sorts of uh, beautiful, inspiring things and also politically motivated things and, and calls to action and constantly changing walls that have got different, um, uh, you know, different people's, um, yeah, like I say, calls to arms um, around different uh, different social issues. So, um, yeah, I do, I do very much recognise and appreciate um, the, the, the importance of art when it comes to, to social change. Great. Yeah, and we're hearing more and more about the importance of art, as Kamari said, and in thinking about Food Visions. Kamari, you should check out, if you haven't, Rockefeller's Food Vision 2020, um, art is part of that. The other um, really important thing that we're starting to document is the use of art institutions as a uh, emergency planning sites, right? So one of the things that happened in New Orleans, for example, right? So this is, again, a segue from URLs. I know this wasn't what you were directly talking about, Kamari, but uh, these are often shelter in place locations. They're amazing, large, if you think of your very large museums, right? They can often house, they often have cafeterias in place. So um, art museums, libraries are becoming important assets to think about in, in food emergency plans as well, often not thought about, right? Is that role artists in addition to as part of a, um, frontline defense, right? Not only providing art and that unification, but often they can be brought in more directly into, into food as well. So Kamari, really welcome that, that perspective. Um, great, anyone else before we close out for the day? Great, we know everyone is really busy running to the end of the year for many of us. Uh, we really appreciate everyone taking the time to be with us today, and, and hopefully you'll share all the great resources um, from the webinar. Florence, anything else from you? No, just to, just to echo your thanks to everyone for joining us. And we have to thanks. see you at the next webinar. Please um, yes, two more. register via the learning platform now. <laughs> great. Thanks, everyone. Yes, register now. All right, and share. Please share.